looking at every city in the world lighting up as daylight passes. So as many of you probably recognize, <clears throat> this is actually 24 hours of air traffic across the globe. And um, seeing this, I can't remember when, it would have been probably 10, 12 years ago. Um, I had a huge aha experience. And that aha experience um, led me to think about not just human systems, which has really been my whole background. My career has been, I think just a minute, I have to stop sharing the screen and then start another one. I'm going to share a different screen now. Yeah. So um, if you can see this new screen, you could put your hand up again. Yes, good. So as I said, when I first uh, saw that, that um, picture of the air traffic control, I realized that the human systems that I had been studying for a good part of my career from looking at how individuals develop, how leaders develop, how teams and organizations, sectors, communities, and then the city, we're looking at one species. And I realized that we probably had an opportunity to learn from another species. I'd like to just start off by sharing a little bit of a passage from Elizabeth Satouris, who some of you may know as an evolution biologist. She's written a new foreword to um, the, re, the second edition of my first book, which is not yet out, but I have the foreword. So what she said was that as she looked down on the Earth's surface from an airplane, whether by day or night, our cities look remarkably like cells nucleated cells with their obvious nuclear downtown hubs, scattered smaller concentrations of buildings like cell organelles, flowing transport systems, extensions into the surround like the pseudopods of amoebae. This has struck me again and again, she says, in flying around Earth as an evolution biologist and futurist, seeking answers to our big questions on whence we came and where are we headed all the while teaching my evolving take on them. Eventually, I realized that cities were indeed living entities and now undergoing a rapid evolution comparable to the origins of the nucleated cells they so resemble. So here again, just a still of that picture, you can see that there is a lot of dynamic interaction between humans in their cities across the earth. Last time, and when I first met Tony, again, through the auspices of Ian, I came down to Edinburgh and last spring was with the Edinburgh uh, Institute of um, Ec Ecology and Spirituality. And uh, I saw my first, ex was given my first exposure to Anthony's uh, cosmology. I would say that the cosmology I'm using is somewhat more simple than Anthony's, but um, I feel that it is really a necessary and useful place to start a discussion of our cities actually possibly Gaia's evolutionary as maturing and evidence of Gaia actually maturing. So this particular slide um, Ian would recognize because this was produced by Brian Eddy, an integral geographer. And what I always liked about it <clears throat> was that it um, managed to capture um, the macrocosm of the birth of the universe from Big Bang right through to the energy and entropy that's going on in the civilization. So universe, solar system, lithosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, biosphere, and troposphere. Well, that's us and our so-called civilization. Um, interestingly, some of you probably know Jude Kuravan's work, who I've uh, finally been exposed to. And she starts not with a big bang, but with a big breath. And I think if we're talking about living systems, that's a really nice um, 
derivation or, or a, a variation of, of thinking of this cosmology. It's interesting that we started out in our chit chat listening to that um, broadcast of the vote in the English Parliament because I think that captures this world of the VUCA vortex, uh, where the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity and ambiguity of what we're living through on a political level is mirrored really, I'd say, in the many different aspects that cities have to consider in order to exist. Finance, energy, water scarcity, climate, environment, food scarcity, collapse. Um, it's a pretty scary lot. And um, I've actually uh, thought about this for a while and thought about it in terms of cosmology. It's not a usual approach to thinking about how we could overcome our threats. But I do put this out that I think that <clears throat> it is actually a stacked deck. And that um, if we muck about with all this, um, even if we consider that it's interdependent with one another, all of these different qualities and aspects and dimensions of life, until we actually um, manage to see that it's evolutionary and that we're going to have to actually align um, our solutions, our approaches to our complex world, I don't think it's actually going to work out too well. So I think that um, Gaia herself, which I am a love Lockean, I would say, um, mm -hmm. and that when I heard um, Lovelock say that uh, Gaia was not only a living system, but that humans um, had something to contribute to her evolution. I sat up and listened. When I look at city discourses, there's lots of books on cities. We're living in the century of the city. That's what the Rockefeller Foundation decided in the year 2000. So on this screen, we can see the SDG goals. We can see Jeffrey West's a really excellent work on complexity in his book, Scale. And one of the world's most well-known uh, urbanist uh, Richard Florida um, talking about crisis in, in many different ways. When I read these or looked at the, the SDG goals, one of the things that struck me was I was very disappointed because I felt that none of them engaged in consciousness and culture, which I feel is uh, uh, absolutely necessary for us to be able to answer some of the questions you were posing at the beginning. How do we figure out how humans actually can change, work, respond, regenerate, actually be something that contributes value to the earth. <clears throat> One of the ways I think about the possibility of understanding that is through a unfolding evolutionary set of capacities that I think humans have demonstrated already. The screen that I'm showing is actually derived from spiral dynamics, so Claire Graves' work and uh, Don Beck's and um, this is just actually illustrating how the values over the lifetime of an individual actually become more and more complex. We know from learning theory and practice and research that um, we actually evolve not because things are working well, but because they're not working well. We are encountering dissonance of some kind, and we're challenged in order for us to be able to um, not only sustain our lives, which I also have a great deal of um, challenge in considering in, in the usual ways that it's presented these days, but that we have to consider that dissonance is the provocation for us to learn, change, and, um, and become not only sustainable, but capable of being able to adapt to new life conditions. So, that's exactly what's happened with the books that I have been looking at uh, for the city. Uh, I started out with the first book looking at the intelligences of a human hive. So I started to think about not only the integral model, which I'll introduce in a few minutes, but to actually think about that we have a way of borrowing from biomimicry and learning from another species namely the honeybee. So after I had a chance to sit with the intelligences that I published this book in 2008, I went out, I'm, Ian knows that I'm actually a pracademic um, um, by nature. I, I have to figure, if 
if this is really good theory, does it work on the ground? So I took it to the field. The second book is Integral City Inquiry and Action, Designing Impact for the Human Hive. And this is really all my field research. If Hillary Bradbury was on the call, <clears throat> she could flip the book over and you'd see a nice quote from Hillary. She says, it's a book of great questions. Um, and I basically tried to look at how to consider cities from a place caring and a place making perspective, bringing together both consciousness and culture along with behaviors and systems. And the third book, which are, I think our, our um, images are all blocking, is actually a book called Integral City 3.7 reframing uh, complex challenges for Gaia's human hives. The 3.7, the seven is thinking about seven generations from now. So trying to think and borrow from the indigenous peoples whose decision sets um, have been not just for the current generation, but for seven generations from now, which sounds like a really good and comfortable place to be with this group of people. So let's look at some of these intelligences that I charted in the first book. I thought that cities uh, started to demonstrate habits. So as I, I said that my career had taken me through uh, different scales of human systems. And there was a certain point long before I looked at cities that I realized the patterns were the same. So that uh, when I learned how individuals changed and started to work with teams, by the time I was um, working with organizations, I realized that these were fractal patterns and that uh, it was very useful to understand that uh, in order to understand the dynamics of what was going on in these increasing scales of systems. So when I came to think about what, if a city is actually a living system, then it's likely to have some kind of collective intelligences. And in fact, I categorized the 12 sets of intelligences as contexting in order to be able to um, see the city within its ecoregion. Um, individual intelligences, because the city is ultimately made up of individual people, and these are both inner and outer. Collective intelligences, which include both cultural and social and systems. And strategic intelligences, and finally, an evolutionary intelligence, which I think drives the whole thing. So um, after I had encountered the air traffic control map, I then also encountered uh, another author who's a bit of a, um, an interesting person who came originally out of entomology and then went into being an impresario for rock and roll bands. And his uh, viewpoint was, oh my goodness, people act an awful lot like the um, ants and bees that I became an expert of in my prior career. And uh, that was Howard Bloom. And Howard Bloom uh, woke me up to the fact that uh, we could not only learn from biomimicry in kind of a metaphorical sort of a way, but there might be actual insights into thinking about a species that if you look on the tree of life, is the most advanced species of the invertebrates. We're supposed to be the most advanced species of the vertebrates. So I thought, okay, the honeybee is 100 million years old. That, that, that's a much longer than our species. Maybe they've learned a thing or two that we might be able to learn from. <clears throat> My organizational self was really intrigued to learn, oh, they've got a goal. Uh, a honey beehive actually has to produce 40 pounds of honey a year in order to survive. And um, what's more, they actually have a way of communicating with one another. They have actually quite a few ways of communicating with one another. They have the dance that they do, and if we were in person, I'd demonstrate that. <clears throat> um, they also have pheromones, so they have a whole chemistry of communication. Um, and they're extremely intelligent. I, I, everybody sends me bee uh, research uh, on an ongoing basis. I saw a wonderful one this week that was demonstrating how <clears throat> bees actually had even learned how to pull strings to get pollen and nectar. Two bees out of ten in the experiment succeeded. And as soon as they closed the experiment down, the other eight learned from the two, and then they took it back to the hive. They're, they're very quick learners. 
<clears throat> and in the beehive, as they um, actually are um, managing the hive by bringing in the pollen and nectar, which is their renewable resource <clears throat> in order to produce their honey, they use uh, four rolls um, plus a, a fifth one. Within the hive, they're called conformity enforcers. They're the ones that are going out and gathering all of the pollen and the um, nectar. There's about 90% of the hive that are conformity enforcers. There are diversity generators. Maybe about 5% of the hive are diversity generators, and their job is to go everywhere the conformity enforcers are not going and bring back new information. There are inner judges who are the probably a hive mind is the way we would think of it these days. These inner judges are the ones that are determining, along with the resource shifters, are we actually achieving our 40 pounds of honey a year? There are also a fifth role that is between hives, the intra-group competitors. So I thought these roles were extraordinarily valuable for me to take a completely new look at the city. It gave me a meta view with a biomimicry lens. And I uh, chose to think about the possibility that the roles in a beehive might be what I would call the voices in the city. And I started to also think that the voices could be organized in such a way that they would fit an integral model. And I'll show you the basic quadrants of the integral model in a moment. But for now, let's just look at the screen that you've got before you and think about the citizens of the city, I propose, are the conformity enforcers in the beehive. They're the ones who are actually doing the majority of the work and the production. If we go to the lower right quadrant and look at business innovators, there are diversity generators. They're the ones that are bringing the new ideas into our human hives and um, managing to make sure that we're, we're actually able to move on. A lot of technology comes out of this area. If we go up into the upper right, we'll see the civic managers. And um, they're in the city, not only city hall, but education. There um, are health authorities, the police, the fire, the emergency, emergency response. They're basically all the resource allocators that make the city possible to work, that make it able for us to actually have uh, conditions that support us. And then that last, that fourth group in the lower left um, is civil society. In Europe, it's called the third sector. And so this will include not-for-profits, the NGOs, and all the faith communities. Um, I think actually that they are our early form of inner judges. Um, they're the ones in the city that are pointing to the marginalized, that are demanding that we have goals, that are being the activists. In the very center of this, you'll see the fifth role, which is the intergroup tournaments, where cities in different ecoregions and, for that matter, across the world, actually do compete for one another, with one another, and um, are, are performing the same role that the bees have as uh, what Bloom called intragroup tournaments, that not only allow a particular hive or city to survive, but to learn from one another and therefore improve the chances of the species surviving in the um, ecoregion and in our case, global conditions. So there you are. I'm going to just sort of pause and say, there's a particular view that is still an ongoing thought experiment and maybe this particular question is one we could take forward. For many years, I asked myself, what is the equivalent in the human hive of the bees' 40 pounds of honey? What is the purpose of a city? And I'm still looking for the answers for that and hope to provoke a few with you tonight. So and let's quickly look at, is it possible that the beehive actually prototypes the human hive in those intelligences that I defined. I'm not going to go through every word on these slides, but just to remind you that I clustered these intelligences into, first of all, contexting. 
I can tell you that bees absolutely have to have contexting intelligences. That's how they know what flowers to go to. Um, they actually have impacted their ecoregions so that the horticulture that they're pollinating is actually specially designed so that they collaborate together. So bees are very ecologically sensitized. They're emergent. They've adapted to every climate on Earth. They're still changing. I think that their communications indicate they are integrated and integral. And they have a life cycle intelligence that, um, again, is often a very touchy subject that I won't go into tonight. But it certainly um, uh, brings a lot of provocation uh, to some of the discussions that are going on in, in human systems around how we manage even to cope with things like gender. If we think about the beehive, it is full of individuals. So each individual bee, uh, can, we can see from research, which is extensive, that they have the capacity to learn as individuals. And then they have this incredible capacity to uh, translate that into their collective intelligences. They also have both the inner life and the outer life of the individual. And, um, and they, they're, they're so healthy in general um, that some of the products they produce, we use for our own health. From a collective intelligence perspective, um, bees are obviously building systems. They have quite a lot of specifications. So they're able to not only build hives that suit a particular climate and ecoregion, um, but they adapt it so that our northern hives are closed hives. They have to manage heat quite differently than if you look at the hives in the southern um, parts of our, our um, planet where they're open hives so that they can aerate it much better. They seem also to have what I would call a culture. In their communications, they have the dance language, and we know that they feed each other. I love the research that says that if you put a marker in a, bee, a bee's pollen when it comes into the hive, within 24 hours, all the 50,000 bees in the hive will have that marker. That is how intricate their communications are. And it reminds me of a beautiful quote that um, inspires me to think about human culture, and that is that people need stories more than food to stay alive. And I think that's something that we need to remember these days as we're trying to sort ourselves out from Brexit and other cultural challenges. Bees have strategic intelligences. Uh, I call them inquiry. Mesh working I'll come to in a minute. Um, and obviously navigating. They're a, a very skilled navigators and can uh, actually tell um, the bees in the hive not only where to go to get the renewable resources, but how far away, what condition that resource is in, um, and uh, even how and when to change the species <clears throat> that they're um, actually going to for the flowers for renewable resources. I'd say they also have an evolutionary intelligence. We can see because of the multiple um, genres that they have um, adapted, they're still evolving. Most of us probably know the story of the Africanized bees. Um, they actually gain <clears throat> an advantage um, over uh, non-Africanized bees because the queen actually matures uh, one day faster, just one day, <clears throat> and that makes the difference. Um, and we also know that if a beehive swarms uh, in, from a domestic set of bees, it, those bees can adapt immediately to the wild if they're not caught by the beekeeper. So if we think about those provocations from our sister species, who is 100 million years old, what can they tell us about warning uh, that we should take notice of for the human hive. Of course, we couldn't um, discount the research that we find about colony collapse disorder. But when we look at what are the causes, it looks an awful lot like what I call the VUCA vortex or the evolutionary set of multiple conditions. Um, and we find that colony collapse disorder cannot be ascribed to only one cause. So bees are having to cope with a very challenging world 
much of which we have created the conditions for as human beings and from their, uh, from their perspective as a species. And beekeepers, the, the ones who are uh, regenerative beekeepers who do it through organic uh, means, basically um, uh, recommend that humans stay out of the solutions, let the bees figure it out because it appears that they have actually had to do something like this multiple times in their hundred billion years and they know better how to do it than we do. So there's my question, what is a city's goal? I propose that a city has these intelligences, that they emerge over time. And I moved the linear set of intelligences into this kind of a GPS system to think about how they might be working together um, in the different clusters of the intelligences. And you'll notice right in the center of the GPS, I put the evolutionary impulse. And I think the evolutionary impulse or the intelligence is the capacity to transcend and include the intelligences that we currently demonstrate in order to allow new intelligences to emerge. For us as humans who want to control everything, this is a really challenging way to consider that the dissonance that we encounter in the world may actually have to be sat through long enough in order for these new intelligences to emerge. How do we see that? Where is the evidence for that happening? One of the early ways that I started to play with possible answers and maps to this was actually to create a set of maps. I can't, we don't have any we're near the amount of time to look at them in individual forms. Tonight, I'm going to briefly show you, here's a hive of the five maps. And I'll just briefly go over each one on a separate slide to tell you where I see the evolutionary impulse working and where the evidence is that Gaia working through us, according to James Lovelock, is evolving a organ that is reflective. We are supposed to be, apparently, Gaia's reflective organs. What evidence is there that we're actually doing this, evolving this? <clears throat> Let's start with what I call map one. For those of you who know the integral model, there are our four quadrants. This is where we typically look at an individual and see that they have capacities that are internal and external, intentional, and biophysical. And we also have um, interrelationship with collectives <clears throat> that give us intersubjective intelligences and interobjective intelligences. You can see in the center is the spiral of the evolutionary impulse moving ever outward in each of the quadrants. Ken Wilbur, who's largely responsible for bringing this map to the world, says that these capacities are all tetra arising. We know if we look at this in finer detail that in fact each of those quadrants isn't a block of intelligences, but they're sets of individual multiple intelligences. And so each one of those multiple intelligences in its own way will be evolving at greater or lesser degree. And we each have different combinations of those. Um, Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences is, is a one way to think of this. I want to skip over to what I call map three, because <clears throat> this is where I start to show what I would call the micro, meso, macro dynamics of the intelligences in the human hive. The top set here is actually the process of seeing that previous map one evolve over the life of an individual, becoming more and more and more complex. You could also think of this as the same as the slide that I showed you earlier um, from Spiral Dynamics. So um, having been 
uh, on the faculty of Royal Roads School of Leadership for uh, 20 years. I just got told that by LinkedIn. I had lost track of that. But at any rate, I've, I had a, a really great opportunity to observe leaders acquire the, this level of capacity. And interestingly enough, uh, for Carrie's uh, early comment, this level of capacity only emerges when the individual finally learns systems, is a systems thinker, is able to see all the other capacities that have gone before, that we need them all in order to operate um, at the, our greatest potential. At Royal Roads, I also had the opportunity to see what it looks like when you take multiple individuals with high capacity and put them together in a high capacity team. I was really, really um, quite impressed when I first encountered them <clears throat> that they were able to be such effective team um, workers and, and actually solve major uh, leadership challenges well, <clears throat> effectively. However, um, the interesting thing about Royal Roads is it uses action, learning action, research, and it takes all of those individuals and teams and throws them back out into their original organizations and agencies and says, now your job in order to produce your thesis and your graduation uh, program is um, actually you have to go work for an organization or an agency and produce um, some um, um, uh, actual evidence of your of your leadership and answer uh, an action research question. So they are now interacting with a lot of people who have very different capacities than they do. <clears throat> Again, if we take that cluster in an organization or a community and then put it into the larger city, we can see that um, these capacities then become interactive with a much greater set of differences. At first, uh, when I encountered this, I thought that could be pretty depressing because it looks like they all get diluted. <clears throat> but with this group of people who are um, really um, experts on complexity, we must flip that around and say, oh, wow, that looks very hopeful because we know in complexity that um, if we change somewhere between 10 to 12, 15% of the system, the rest of it comes along for free. And so this idea of um, considering the dynamics and learning capacities of individuals, teams, and groups as they are dynamically interacting in the city is one of the big questions I have right now. I have been working a little bit with Enlivening Edge and the Teal organizations, and I've asked them, show me the cities who have the most advanced organization clusters and those are the cities, I'm going to say, are likely to have a change in governance. So before we move off the maps, I'll throw in map four, which is really another derivation from spiral dynamics, but one I like because it shows the structures of organizations as they complexify over time, from the individual hearth right through to global organizations. <clears throat> And we know that all of these are alive and well. Um, so in the city, we have all of them coexisting. And if we have only one frame of an organization and think that all other organizations are the same, um, then we will have a great deal of difficulty seeing how the dynamics of the city um, can be explained or understood. But when we can step back and see all of these organizational structures are coexisting, and in fact, if we took this particular map and realized it even acts as a proxy for our brains, this is how our, our minds themselves um, are actually changing and becoming more complex. The last map I'll comment on is one that I would call holarchies. So, once again, when I started looking at individuals, this is the map that, where I started to recognize, okay, we've got a lot of patterns that are not only fractal with one another, but they're holographic and they keep increasing in scale. And that everyone on this call probably belongs to each one, uh, could wear a hat for each one of these individual um, holons 
in this whole archy individual family group mm -hmm. all our organizations communities the city the eco region we had more time i'd spend a little few minutes on map five which is us the map of spirituality in the city just let's notice that <clears throat> the ground of being i've noticed there is love and um that is actually something that relates to the big breath and the consciousness that jude kurovan is talking so much about these days it is also the key to something that i came to a conclusion of in writing the last chapter of book one I like to summarize my books in the last chapter. And as I was sitting there figuring out, well, what did I say in the previous 11 chapters? I realized that there was a code that had emerged, um, a code of care. I've called it the master code. I've actually uh, learned it originally <clears throat> when I was uh, doing my doctoral work in the Burkana community of conversations. And um, it's uh, an urban myth, I think, that came from Actually, New Zealand was where I heard it in the first time. And that is, um, a, a principal came out and told his school at the beginning of year, the year that there was going to be um, only three rules that everybody had to remember. First of all, you had to care for yourself, and you had to care for each other, and together we would care for the place. And I looked at the city and the ways of, <clears throat> I had metamapped it, and I said, that is actually the fractal of what we need to do for the decision sets, I think, that line up care for person, so we can care for people, so we can care for place, and care for the planet. <clears throat> so this caring to the power of four, if you will, is what I consider to be the master code of being able to live well in the city. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but if I have a few more minutes, I'll throw in mesh working and then we can go mesh ourselves into some groups. Is that okay, Anthony? Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay. So um, one of the intelligences that I cluster into the strategic group is called mesh working. I loved this word when I came across it. I originally learned it from Don Beck, but uh, I had to go look it up in uh, brain sciences, which is really where it comes from. And this intelligence actually weaves together the best of two operating systems. One is self-organizing, and the other is sorting and structuring. Um, it aligns complex responsive structures that flex and flow and allows them to emerge in a hierarchy of complexity. So for those of us who are pointing at our disappointments in does sustainability actually hold any water these days or resilience? I feel like mesh working is a way of being able to capture the best, best of both. I think that how mesh works function is that when dissonance, dissonance triggers the system, self organizing kicks in. That is actually how our brains are organized. They're constantly self organizing. And the self-organizing enables resilience. But we are actually um, energy um, poor and we need to manage our energy and the brain takes a lot of energy. <clears throat> so it is always looking for repeated patterns and in the sorting of selecting to discover those patterns, it actually locks them in as learning structures. And I think that's where sustainability comes from, that we need to have both the capacity to be self-organizing and the ability to sort and select to create structures. I think that if we took those kinds of approaches, we could solve our big challenges um, because we would be bringing um, more than one mode of thinking and decision making in order to approach our, our, our VUCA vortex. Something to just give you as a final set of pictures rather than words, going back to the quotation that I gave you from Elizabeth Saturis. Interestingly, I had come to the same conclusion as I was flying over cities, and I started to look down on them and see a meshwork. And in a meshwork, the first stage is individuals start to form groups. 
then the groups create a network. The networks create communities of practice. And the communities of practice transform into spheres of influence that dynamically interact with one another. So I actually do anticipate that what we are evolving, if we survive long enough, is a global meshwork of human hives. And this is the global meshwork that is going to actually enable us to create Gaia's own way of being reflective as an organ. I borrowed and turned on its ear Jude Kuravan's way of coining this. <clears throat> Meshworking delivers local action, global feeling, and cosmic thinking. She's usually saying what we need to do for the unity that she sees in the cosmic hologram is to think cosmically, feel globally, and act locally. So just to summarize, I think the emergence of integral city through growing place practices is what I think is possible. I think that if we had Elizabeth Saturis in the room, she'd say, it's not unusual to have this state of evolution as a kind of a mess. Because when she looks at biological systems, she sees the basic sort of three tracks they go through. First one is full of consumption, overconsumption. The second one becomes competitive, overcompetitive. And finally, when the system figures out it's much more energy efficient to be collaborative, then collaboration emerges. Here is some evidence that I see this happening. I go back to my colleague, Brian Eddy, who drew these nice little um, pseudopods, images of different stage and states of, of, of um, urban systems at different stages of growth. He's actually patterned it on the back uh, over the uh, spiral dynamics emergence levels of complexity. <clears throat> and um, so we can see that in regions, when we're comparing different cities to one another, they, they do have different characteristics, different capacities. Um, there are large organizations, sectors that have seized ways of looking at cities. Smart Cities was created and coined by IBM. That's been around for about 20 years. Resilient Cities was coined by the Rockefeller Foundation. It's been around for about 10 years, five years even, um, and has 100 so-called resilient cities in the world. And Integral City is still working its way through trying to bring consciousness and culture to transcend and include those. Why do I have so much hope? Not only am I a radical optimist, but I've my first book was translated into Russian. So I've done a lot of work in the last few years in Russia. Uh, last year when I went there, they showed me this beautiful diagram of their li living cities association, which intends to change 1,000 cities by 2030. And I looked at this diagram and I said, well, that's a really ni re nice representation of the master code, the uh, development and care for self so that you can care for others, so that we can care for our place, so we can care for 1,000 places in Russia. Um, I was in Amsterdam last summer for a conference called We Make the City. I don't know if David Beattie was able to go there, but that was an opportunity to see how the interactivity of that particular conference could demonstrate the city is making the planet. That as we work through a planet of integral cities, we will create a super organism, and that in itself will become Gaia's reflective organ. Will it be 100 years from now? Or 500? Or 1,000? I don't know. Um, things tend to happen faster than we think is possible. And also, there's all sorts of possibilities that there will be unexpected consequences of where we are now. So it's impossible to know if the reflective organ <clears throat> will emerge um, as indications are that it is. I say, coining a little bit of Rumi, out beyond the smart city and out beyond the resilient city lives the integral city. There's a field. 
we call it the knowing field. And I think I've met you there tonight. Thank you. Cities as Gaia's reflexive organs. David, yes. Well, I'm comparing the energy from the discussions uh, in our small room and, and Marilyn's talk to our initial sort of discouragement is hearing what happened in the uh, house house today with the uh, Brexit. So maybe in fact we are in fact already jumping past that level of evolution. <laughs> right. Let's hope. <laughs> Yeah, Christina, yeah. I wanted to say that I um, really enjoyed Marilyn's discussion um, because I was working on a project earlier this year on open smart cities. So there's quite a lot of fuss in Canada about smart cities. You may know the Sidewalk Alphabet Project in Toronto and this open smart cities ideas to try to integrate some of these principles around, you know, how do you, how do you balance um, gathering data, access to data, privacy, and, and what, gathering data can collectively can help us what problems it can help us solve and um, so but that but that approach doesn't really get us to that sort of integrated with the ecology this breaking down this binary that all good geographies geographers will have spent much of their careers talking about nature and society and so the integral um, approach uh, really I think offers something on top of the smart city and the resilient city um, what I'm a little bit confused about, and I'm not sure this is the forum for that, was really understanding what you mean by intelligences and, and in terms of, you know, often we talk about uh, data, information, knowledge, wisdom. So I was kind of wondering, well, where does intelligence fit in that kind of rubric? And two, um, are you making some assumptions about those intelligences within a city um, being equivalent? So I'm thinking again, in the context of Canada and multiculturalism and how do those, how do those intelligences, I mean, I, I, one way to analyze some of the challenges we have in, in integrating communities is around saying, well, actually they're coming with really different, if I understand correctly, intelligences. So I'll just offer those. I don't know if you want to take those questions, but offer those as some of my reflections. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I respond? Do I have enough time, Anthony? Short uh, brief, Briefly, yeah. So thanks, Christina, for the questions. Um, I would say intelligence is our capacities. So um, the knowledge and the experience and the differences, they all contributed to, to developing these capacities. And I tried to, you know, if you look at first the uh, first book, each chapter is about a different intelligence and the scientific evidence I could find for it. So I was looking to see, you know, is that a justifiable intelligence? And yes, they are different. And that, that it taught me, Christine, it taught me to understand politics in Canada and why um, the provinces vote differently, even, never mind cities. And it woke me up to that. Another thing came up in our discussion was choice that, um, you know, from a personal perspective, uh, two of us living in a semi-idyllic rural context um picturing that the future of life is in cities um the the the, the tension between that kind of individual value predilection and the logistics of um three quarters of 10 billion people living on a small spherical planet with a stressed biosphere um, and so on. So the, the interesting to reflect on the, the impact of your uh, image there on personal experience, uh, where theoretically that looks great, but personal lifestyle, no way. Uh, will we all change over the generations for that not to be an issue of course is another um dimension of that the seven generation thing in seven generations what i've just said will be silly possibly 
How does it look from down under, Phil? Oh, sorry, up over, I should say. Yeah, indeed. I mean, um, I, I think, um, and David and Ian chip in and correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we were having something of a dystopian conversation, I, I probably has to be said, uh, particularly struck by uh, the concept, I think there's a diagram you have earlier in your, your, your pack, Marilyn, which is essentially like the stacked plates getting progressively smaller with um, essentially civilization on top and the solar system below. Um, and uh, we, I, I, I guess the thing that struck me was cities as a reflection of um, our innate capacity to draw energy through that network um, ahead of time, in essence. So c cities themselves, and we, we reflected on respective cities around the table, um, as really products and very successful adapters of what has been drawn out of the lithosphere. And so the question then becomes to what extent as we move forward, uh, we are reflective of a different energy, both source but also quality too. Um, and if we compare that with uh, the hive concept, then certainly within a bee colony, they have a far more stable energy platform or an energy process. Um, so that was kind of where we got to. We didn't get, I think I'd say, uh, Ian, David, do feel free to add to this because it's probably where I got to. Um, we didn't sort of move too much further forward than that. We would, we, we, I guess we, we reflected on the fact that as an ecological niche, as a city, if circumstances change, then potentially you die out. Um, so that is the, the sort of, I guess, a collapse scenario, which is so we sort of moved into more dystopian territory. <laughs> and, and I would say the bees have given me hope because when they are gathering their energy sources, they're also giving back to the eco-region and pollinating it and creating renewable resources for next year. And that has also been another question. Can't we do the same? Can't we actually shift our capacities to do that? That is a very big question. Um, and I, I won't even attempt to answer it in the, in the two minutes we have remaining, because I suspect uh, we will be here for the, uh, I, it's easy for me, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning, but I'm conscious it's late at night for some. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so we um, we probably are, are migrating into um, uh, regenerative ideas, and Daniel Wahl um, will be giving us um, one of these sessions, I think, um, in May. Yes, we've got him for May. So it'd be interesting to sort of digest um, Marilyn's image and uh, understandings and um, bring those forward into a, a, a conversation about uh, regenerative cultures. Um, that, that sounds like a, um, a fun potential one plus one equals three. Mm. Uh, we play those together. Um, well, uh, looking at the time and recognizing that um, uh, I think only Kerry is actually on the European mainland, um, as we see it from Britain, uh, an hour later that uh, our time's run out. Um, so I'd like, very much like to thank Marilyn for sharing this with us.